Stanford University. So as you've learned from the earlier speakers, every act you take and every thought you make is a result of neurons in your brain firing, of synapses giving off little packets of chemicals called neurotransmitters, and synapses picking them up. And that's what causes what we do and what we think. What we do and what we think is what we really care about in people. We care a little bit about their bodies and how they look, but what we really care about in people is their behaviors and their thoughts. That's what the law cares about, too. Neuroscience is teaching us how to correlate, how to see and correlate physical changes in brain state with changes in mental state. And that's going to revolutionize our world as we learn more and more about how our behaviors, where our behaviors come from, how they're developed, what we're thinking and how we can tell what other people are thinking, the world will change. And as the world changes, the law will change as well. I do a seminar on law and neuroscience. I get 30 hours with eager students. I currently have eight minutes and 42 seconds. <laughs> so I'm going to hit high points in four areas, prediction, mind reading, responsibility, and interventions. Start with prediction. In a few years, I am confident we will be able to say with 90 to 95 percent accuracy, for any person age 60 or over, you will or you will not be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease within the next 15 years. How many of you would like to take that test? <laughs> Raise your hands. How many of you don't want to take that test? Which half of you is crazy? People will disagree because knowledge has consequences. And some people want the knowledge and the consequences, and some people don't. And it has consequences legally as well. What about employment discrimination based on who's going to get Alzheimer's? What about long-term care insurance? And whether you would like to buy long-term care insurance if you're going to get Alzheimer's, the long-term care insurance people won't want to sell it to you if you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. What about relations within families, when the kids decide to take away your car keys? Does that come earlier or later when they've seen the prediction that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease? Financial planning, people trying to figure out how to save their assets and pass their assets on, knowing that there's going to be this long period of need for care. That'll have legal implications. Even though it's a medical thing and it's being driven, this research isn't being driven to predict for people. It's being driven so we can understand better how this filthy disease works and intervene and try to prevent it. But the knowledge of, of how it works allows us to predict, and prediction has social meanings and social consequences that aren't intended from the initial scientific research. Now, more directly law, the law is really interested in predicting things too. It's interested in predicting whether this defendant, if we let him out, is going to do it again or not. We have some ways to predict that. We know they're not very good. What if we got better ways? There is a condition called psychopathy. It doesn't necessarily involve eating human liver and drinking Chianti. <laughs> but it involves people who have no empathy for others, no feeling for others, care nothing for others. It's estimated that about 1% of the adult population is psychopathic. It's estimated that about 30% of prisoners are psychopaths. Psychopaths commit crimes at a much higher rate. A friend of mine named Kent Keel thinks he can see in brain scans the signature of psychopathy. What if he's right? What if we can say, this guy's a psychopath, leave him in for a lot longer? Or what if we can take a thousand 15-year-old boys and say, these 10 are psychopaths? What do we do then as a society? Do we lock them up and throw away the key? Do we do nothing? Do we put GPS bracelets on them? Do we warn the neighbors? What will we do? Mind reading. I am reading minds right now. We all read minds all the time. It's a survival skill for us. It's been a long time since lions and tigers and bears were the things we had to worry about most. Most of what we have to worry about 
is whether that guy in front of you is going to share food with you or hit you over the head. <laughs> Reading people's minds is a crucial survival skill. If you can't do it, you're seriously disabled. It's one of the problems in some forms of autism. We're all mind readers, but we know we're not very good mind readers. Or poker wouldn't exist, <laughs> and romance would look a lot different. <laughs> our thoughts, our emotions, our reactions are caused by physical changes in our brains. If we can see those physical changes, we may be able to correlate them with the thoughts. And people are doing that. Neuroscientists around the country are figuring out how to go from physical brain states to infer the mental states. Anthony Wagner here in the psychology department has been able, with over 85% accuracy, to tell when showing undergrads photos of faces whether they think they recognize the faces or not. Sean Mackey in the anesthesia department here has shown with, again, about 85% accuracy that he can put people in the scanner and figure out whether or not they are feeling pain. And that may not sound very important, but in fact, pain is a huge issue for the law. Hundreds of thousands of cases each year, not just auto accidents, but things like social security disability determinations, hinge on whether or not somebody is having pain, and if so, how much pain. And we don't have very good tests for it. Pain is in the brain. It feels like it's in the hand, but it's up here. If we can read minds and see pain, the world will change. And not just for lawyers. Doctors have to confront patients coming in saying, you know, doc, that codeine isn't working anymore. I think I need that oxy whatever it is stuff. <laughs> and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And doctors have to roll the dice and make a guess about what it is. There are now two companies in the US, CFOS and one with the, I'm not making this up, name of No Lie MRI, <laughs> which will take $5,000 from you, put you in a scanner, and ask you questions on a topic you want to have questions asked to you about. They will then tell you whether they think you were lying or not. If you like their answer, they will give you a nice, fancy report. If you don't like their answer, they will tear up the report and forget they ever saw you. They will not give you your money back. There have been two court cases within the last year and a half trying to introduce this into evidence. It was rejected, I think, properly both times. What if it gets better? How will we use this knowledge? Will we be able to force people to undergo it? Will we not? What will we do? Responsibility. I have good and brilliant friends who believe the following. Neuroscience will teach us all there is no free will. Since there is no free will, the criminal justice system will disappear. I have no friends who are lawyers who believe that. <laughs> in part because we lawyers know that criminal justice is about a lot more than just punishing people for bad things. It's about deterring them, deterring others, locking them up so they can't hurt other people, and sometimes even rehabilitating them. But there are areas where the law cares about your mental state, your moral state, and there are occasional cases. We will see more of them, I think, like this one, the pedophile tumor. High school teacher in Virginia, 40 years old, normal guy, normal life, second marriage, 12-year-old stepdaughter, begins to get interested in pornography, begins to collect it obsessively, and then misbehaves, I think, in a relatively minor but not trivial way with the stepdaughter. She tells her mom, the mom tells the police, he pleads guilty to the lowest level of child molestation. He's got a perfect record. They say, go through this 12-step program. If you come out clean, you don't go to prison. If you flunk it, you go to prison. He doesn't want to go to prison. This is smart. Pedophiles do not do well in prison. Prisoners hate them. Guards hate them. It's a bad thing. He fails miserably. He's propositioning everybody and everything, animal, mineral, and vegetable. They tell him, Wednesday, you go back to court, you're sentenced to prison. On Tuesday, he complains of terrible headaches. They think he's faking it. He loses control of his, of his bladder. They think he's faking it. Finally, they decide to take him to the ER. They do a CT scan. He has a tumor the size of a chicken egg in his left frontal lobe. They take the tumor out. He says, all those urges have gone away. He passes the 12-step program with flying colors. He's released on probation. Ten months later, he tells his probation officer, the urges are coming back. Probation officer doesn't send him to prison. He sends him back to the ER. The tumor had grown back. They took out the tumor a second time. 
The urges went away, and for the three years of follow-up we know of, he's been crime-free. What do you do with a case like that? Is he guilty? Is his tumor guilty? Do we imprison his tumor? <laughs> what will we do? Last area, interventions. The whole point of this is interventions. Money is being spent in this research not so my friends can learn cool stuff, although that's nice, but so we can cure, prevent, treat nasty illnesses. I've now had three colleagues at the law school in my 27 years diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. That's a vile thing. If we can treat that and cure that and prevent that, that's a wonderful thing. But as we learn more about intervening in the brain, we might be able to treat other things. A Chinese group recently published in a peer-reviewed literature a cure for opiate addiction. They burn out two regions of the brain, the nucleus accumbens in both hemispheres, and they reported these men no longer craved opium. They did not report what else they no longer craved. <laughs> what if we could do brain interventions to cure addiction, to cure smoking interests, to cure voting Democratic or Republican? to cure being atheist or being religious, to cure sexual orientation. Would we allow that? Should we allow that? Does it matter how voluntary it is? And what do we mean by voluntary? If the judge says, okay, you can go to prison for 30 years, or you can have this simple brain operation. Your choice, free choice. Is that a free choice? What will we do? And that's what I want to leave you with. I've asked lots of questions. I haven't given you any answers. Part of that is because on many of these, I don't know the answers. But part of it is, the one thing I do know, these questions are arising, will arise, we will have to have answers for them. And I believe, and this is a statement of faith, not empirically supported, that we will do better. The more people know that those questions are out there, the more people are thinking about them, the more people care and pay attention to them, the less likely we are to mess up badly. That's a minor ambition, but that's my ambition, <laughs> to see if we can prevent catastrophes. So I charge you, have your synapses changed by today, remember what I and my colleagues have said, and go out and think about how neuroscience is going to revolutionize our world and what kind of world you want it to be revolutionized into. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.